Good morning, everyone. We're going to give it just a couple of minutes here to let everyone get settled and give them a minute or two to join us. Um, and then we'll get started here. All right, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Veronica O'Hearn and I am with the Iowa Arts Council. Thank you for joining us for the Nature Through Lens and Form Artist Talk by Iowa Artist Fellow Paul Brook. We are also joined today by Sarah Florian, the Iowa Arts Council's Program and Operations Coordinator who will be assisting with the tech for this webinar. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. If you require closed captioning, you may enable it now by clicking the closed captioning or CC button at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and will be sent to all registrants after the event. If you have any technical difficulties, please let us know in the chat. You may also use the chat to send in any comments or questions for Paul. We will take time to answer any questions at the conclusion of the presentation. This event is the second in the Iowa Arts Council's 2022 Meet the Artist series, which features the five Iowa Artist Fellows through Artist Talks held on Thursdays at noon in April and May. We encourage you to check out our event calendar at iowaculture.gov to sign up for the remaining three talks by photographer Brittany Brooke Crow, writer Emma Murray, and filmmaker Francesca Sones. And if you missed visual artist Louise Kames earlier, Kamus, excuse me, earlier this month, you can check out a recording of her talk on our YouTube channel at Iowa Culture. For those who aren't familiar, the Iowa Arts Council is your state arts agency, and we provide funding, professional development, and networking opportunities for artists, nonprofits, schools, and communities working to advance the arts in Iowa. Our work is funded by the state and federal governments through the Iowa Legislature and the National Endowment for the Arts. Today's event is part of the Iowa Artist Fellowship Program, which recognizes five outstanding Iowa artists each year and provides them with resources and funding to advance their careers in Iowa. The goal of this Meet the Artist Program is to create connections across Iowa and beyond by introducing the artist fellows and their work to those of you making, presenting, and supporting the arts in other areas of the state. Today, we will hear from Paul Brook, and we encourage you to use the chat to engage with each other and send in any questions or comments that you may have for Paul. We'll take time at the end to answer any questions that you submit. So with that, I'll do a brief introduction of Paul. Uh, Paul holds a PhD in creative writing from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and is a professor of English at Grandview University. He is the author of six books, including Light and Matter, Meditations on Egrets, Sirens and Serimas, Arm Wrestling at the Iowa State Fair, Jaguars of the Northern Pantana, and The Scald and Drunken Trollican. Um, Brooke was nominated for two Pushcart Prizes and won the Iowa Prize for Poetry. His writing has been published in the North American Review, the Antioch Review, and Scientific American. Several of his images have been shortlisted for the Bird Photographer of the Year and won as a finalist for Wildlife Photographer of the Year in 2020. His photographs have appeared in Audubon and Wild Planet magazines. He has exhibited his work across North America. Brooke currently serves as chair of the awards committee for the North American Nature Photographers Association, as managing editor for Gold Wake Press, and as Acquisitions and Developmental Editor at Atmosphere Press. So with that, I will turn it over to Paul. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Veronica. Appreciate your introduction. Uh, uh, and thanks to, thanks to the, um, thanks for everybody for, for, for putting this together today. And of course, the Iowa Arts Council for 
making this possible. And certainly this has been a great year for me because of the support that they've been giving um, with this fellowship. So let's get to it. So my plan today, of course, is to uh, kind of take you through uh, take you through what what I went through this past year uh, and continue uh, continue doing this summer. And so this is me uh, looking out across. This was last month. Uh, I was in Chile, uh, uh, chasing uh, pumas around, photographing them. And as you can see, like the landscape there is just breathtaking and fantastic. So we'll get to it in a little bit. But let me let me just say first that during this fellowship, I did a whole lot of things and I'm still doing things. But um, I've been receiving and guidance and support for improving my career as a as an artist. Um, I was able to go to Hartford, Connecticut. And there I learned a new photographic technique uh, on the scanning electron microscope. And what's really cool is now they have a new one uh, that is in color. That one was in black and white. And then I'm talking about eventually doing more what we call wet sim work, which is actually uh, you can do live specimens uh, or specimens in water. Uh, and that was before almost impossible. So that's pretty awesome. So that's coming up, I hope, one day soon. And then I've finished uh, new poems, including these things called Cueca Chilenas, and I'll show you what those are in a little bit. Um, of course, I traveled to Torres del Paine, that is a national park in Chile, and I photographed 12 pumas over a week-long stay there. And I just finished completing my new book called Finding Meteorites in Antarctica, basically covering seven continents using form poetry. So I'm going to walk you through all that today to kind of show you like not only kind of like what's going on with the fellowship, but certainly um, what's really how my art works in a kind of philosophy and action statement. So there you go. So anyway, here I here here is, if you can kind of see the under image here, um, that is actually a giant hornet. And what you have to do is you coat them in gold. Um, it's called sputter coating. And then once you do that and you place it into the sim, that's that the box on the left there. Uh, it, it pulls all the air out of that particular mechanism, and then you can photograph at a very high resolution, up to 100,000 times magnification. So if you see the screen, I'm actually photographing um, a penguin feather, and um, this is like, uh, you can see the grid marks there, but it's actually 32 shots all smashed together into one. So we'll actually combine those for you uh, as you're doing it, which is pretty remarkable. And some of the images I got were pretty, pretty awesome and fun. If you can see on the right here, on the tip of my finger is a burr, right? So if you've ever been out walking in the forest and you're, you get burrs on you, that's the size they are here. They're stick seed burr. And that is on the left, the projections, right, of the stick seed burr that come out and hold onto the fur or onto your clothing. And that's what they look like, right, at 260 times uh, resolution, which is pretty remarkable. Yeah, so that's cool. And um, I was just surprised uh, at the how how definitively in focus it was when you would find when I finally figured it out. It took a while, but I spent the entire day there. Um, got lots of good photographs. That I was very happy with. And uh, let's show you show you one other one, perhaps. It's okay. Well, we'll keep talking about it. I don't know what's going on, but I think it's just locked up on me. We'll try. I don't know what's happening. Let me see something. Do you want to try to stop sharing? Maybe try resharing it. Yeah, I'll try. Let's try it again. Yeah. See if that does it. There we go. So this is actually a honeybee leg uh, with with pollen grades on it. This is also 260 times magnification. All those little football sized little pieces there, those are all pollen grains. And if you looked at the bee, there were thousands of them strewn throughout the bee's body. And uh, this was this was the craziest part was I was taking these samples with me. Of course, I had to take them on the plane, so I had to be really careful. But this was just laying next to my stepson's car in the garage, and I picked it up. And it was just the tiniest thing. It was like this small, like this tiny little bee, but it was all this detail. And I think the really important thing to note here is that you really have to be aware that there are just beautiful things everywhere uh, you look. 
even in your garage, even on the floor of your garage, which is nuts. So that's great. The other thing I've been working on is in this collection, and then also not only with photography, is looking at things in a new way, was really trying to understand different cultures and different continents in terms of the way they write and the way they construct the world. So I've been going through the various continents and trying to find various kinds of forms that kind of really set the stage or make you think about how people think there, right? So one of the forms I've been working in uh, is called contrapuntal, which is a, a Chinese form that is actually, you can read the poem three ways, right? So you have column one here then column two, and then you can read it across as well. And um, I'm gonna read this one for you. I won't read all of them, but some, okay? And this is called Becoming Wasp, Becoming Orchid. So I'll just read the whole thing across. I dream the orchid, I dream the wasp, quivered at its sepal wings, shuddered at its slender petiole, its column of flesh, its plump thorax, its luscious scent, its electric vibrato. Fell a hundred million times, tried to reinvent myself, a series of rhizomes conjuring future visions, a tiny set of threads, an artist rendering, each stitch made more, each stroke made more, alluring, intoxicating, inflorescent, reminiscent. Imitation is not flattery. Imitation is necessity. Attraction is merely a convex mirror, a nod to the self, a wink. I won't read this one, but this is another form I've been working in for North America. And this is called a golden shovel. And what you do is you take, a, I think a semi-famous line or a, a line from a poet. And then you work that line into the last word of every line that you're writing. So this is a poem by Gary Snyder. Um, and you can see turn bathing and fluttering in frothing wave lip, light lapping between the round stones we gather driftwood for firewood. So I've worked that all the way through the poem and then played off of it. And then I, this one was probably the most complex. I, I was, I, I like to read dictionaries. That's, I know it sounds weird and funky, but it helps me really understand like language construction, but also tells you a lot about the, the place. And so I started studying uh, the Awabaka language in Australia. And I really started to learn about Aboriginal poetry songs. And so they actually sing these, right? So this is a way for them to remember. It's more of a mnemonic device, but it helps them like perform these. And this is called Tung Tung, and I'll read this one. And you can probably hear the musicality. It's more like a ballad. The Tung Tung is for tomorrow and meat is for today. Don't ruin the rue with sorrow. There is no other way. The marrow is for tomorrow. It makes a broth delayed. It makes sauce and flavor uh, borrows. There is no other way. The Tung Tung is for tomorrow. Eat fresh cuts right away. With bones set aside for tallow, there is no other way. The marrow is for tomorrow, all fed children horse play. The hunters feel content and know there is no other way. And then I will read this one, it's very short. This is, a, this is actually an African form that is, full, it is 32 syllables long. And basically you look at two, four, six, eight, six, four, two. And then it's supposed to give you some kind of wisdom, right? So the into is a way to do that. And this is called Baobab. Inside the elephant, the seed churned, acid burned, germinated by brutality, we learned from misery, a stone deep in our guts. So um, I was lucky enough uh, as part of this project to, to go to Torres del Paine you translate that it basically in, in native language there means uh, towers of blue and honestly it is true there are towers of blue now we're rhyming all the time and this is just honestly in terms of uh, places I've been that have been mystical and magical and transformative just ridiculous it was just gorgeous I it was like living like living in a dream sometimes I would be like am I really here uh, walking right like in this this place, uh, there was just this incredible light and just uh, all these animals moving around. And, and here I am again, same shot. But it was, it was interesting to be there because 
I was trying to do this form sequence of, of narrative form. And so I was very interested in, you know, I, I'm, I'm very fascinated by apex predators, right? And so the puma, much like the jaguar that I've done research on before, is a really interesting marker here in terms of the health and the, of the environment. We talk, I talk a lot about this in my environmental literature class, but they really are the, the, the linchpin, if you will, in trophic cascade. If you pull them out, everything's gonna tumble. And guanacos are their primary prey, right? Here's a, here's a guanaco looking out over the scene, basically looking for pumas because they're always on guard. And this is a lone male. And when they're by themselves, they're more vulnerable and more likely to be taken down. So I, I was interested and I wrote a lot of these poems before I went, which is weird because basically I lived the whole thing and it played out exactly as I had written it before I left, which is so weird, but pretty awesome. So this is, uh, uh, Quaker Chilenas are based, uh, the word Quaker is a ritual courtship dance. And if you look at the syllable scheme, I won't read it, but it's basically, you can see they're mostly nine syllables, but kind of moved, moved around. And then it has a A, B, C, B, B, D, E, D rhyme scheme with a repeated line, the double Bs there, the capital Bs are rhymed. And then that fifth line must be that repeated line with the word yes in front of it, okay? So let's go to one, let's try it. So. This is about a guy, not me, who goes there and basically gets all his stuff ripped off and he's completely destitute, has no money. Now, here's what's crazy. I get to Lima, Peru, and they won't let me into Chile because my COVID test, they say, is not authentic, but I don't know what that means, but whatever. So I'm stuck in Lima, which is fine. I don't think I'm going to get to Chile. So I feel like I'm, you know, living out the poem in some funny way. Uh, I was not suicidal, though. I was very upset, but not, not, I didn't get that, that crazy, but it was it was the feeling of loss of control, right? And I think that's the poem. So here we go. Stolen passport, safe in his hotel room ransacked. Man scours grasses for cash under blue towers, hocked hills. Winds slant him like a backslash. Yes, winds slant him like a backslash. Guanacos graze in small herds. Stone broke without prospect in limbo. He imagines suicide, unnerved. And the other thing was, I was when I was supposed to, when I was in Lima, I was supposed to be fo photographing Chilean flamingos in the Atacama Desert, which did not happen, by the way. And I was very disappointed, and didn't think I would see any. Well, clearly I did. Uh, my guide actually knew where th there were some, and so we were able to get some. I got some really good shots of them, which is you can see how beautiful they are. They have black underwings; they're just gorgeous. And also Darwin's rhea, which is much smaller. Uh, it's like an ostrich. Uh, looking kind of thing, um, but very tiny compared to an ostrich's big size. I did actually find a rhea egg, which I left, but I was hoping that the, the puma would eat it, but it didn't see it. And then it was really interesting. So nature photography, if, if, if you don't know, um, you, you've really got to be at the level of the animal or below it. You, you're, quite, you're trying to not show dominance, but you're trying to show submissiveness, right? So this is, a, this is a gray fox, one of three we saw, the only one I could get close to. And so as I, we were actually on a ranch, so I had permission, but I jumped the fence. And I, as I jumped the fence, he laid down and then was posing for me. Don't, don't ask me how or why, I didn't have anything to do with it. But it was 50 mile an hour winds. And so I really wanted to get this shot of showing like how windy it is, you get a sense of that. And also just the beauty of the animal trying to take this most really beautiful shot, specimen shot I can to show that. And the same with, with, with guanacos, right? They're hard to photograph sometimes because of the, sh the shadowing that goes on and you have very harsh light. And so it blows out a lot of their features. You also get, you're getting a sense of the landscape, right? You see like how, how the landscape looks and kind of like what their situation is, okay? And it's a hard life. If you're a guanaco, it's, 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 you think, oh, my life is hard. No, uh, I mean, I'm guessing there've been hundreds of thousands of these things killed over the years in this region by th you know, generations and generations of pumas. And everywhere you go, you find carcasses like this one. And uh, it's, a, it's a tough existence. And you have to always be on, on edge and be ready to go and uh, get out of the way. And if you do succumb, uh, they will come for you, right? So this is the Andean condor, the largest bird's uh, wingspan in the world at 12 feet. 
And actually, this was the most dangerous part of my trip. We were on a cliff about a thousand feet up and the wind was just insane. I don't know, once again, 30 to 40 to 50 mile an hour winds and just unsteady footing on a cliff trying to photograph these things, but they're really magnificent and it's fun to see them at eye level. So I do have a poem that goes with this one and hopefully you can read it. If not, I'll read it out loud to you. So this is called Andean Condor. At first foul taint of me, they uplift, catching thermals, priest condor circle. No, I do not have much time. Guanaco with leg ensnared. Yes, Guanaco with leg ensnared. From black lichen rock, condors descend. My distressing cries, they're hue to cull, bedridden, rotten. I am condemned. So you're wondering, oh, how close did you get to these pumas? And were you safe? I was very safe. I never was worried at all that they would attack me. Um, here, and I'll, I'm gonna play a video in about two seconds. This is actually Hermanita. She was actually filmed by the BBC um, over a couple month period. And she was very not happy with us following her. And, and we didn't spend a lot of time with her because she just was annoyed. And then she ran off and hid. So we just left her alone. But let me, let me show you, if you look down at the kill, I'm sitting on top of the hill, look down at the, in the middle of the shot kind of to the right. And you can see her come in. Here she comes. You can see, once again, you can see the mountains in the background, just the beauty of the landscape. She's on a kill. This is not her kill. This is another Puma's kill. She comes in, she smells it, she leaves. She comes back, she smells it again, she leaves because she realizes if she eats it, another Puma will come and attack her. So she's like, I'm not gonna mess with this. But to be 80, 90 feet away from this, my, this was the first Puma I saw, uh, the, like the second day I was there and it was just remarkable in so many ways. Now this is... This oh, you just muted yourself, Paul. I think you hit the mute. Okay, gotcha, thank you. <laughs> yep. uh, this is uh, Caron and she's named for a lake that's below her. And so one of the things is I was trained as a biologist early in my career. And so I'm always thinking about how animals are gonna move. Now you can't always predict it, but you have some good ideas. Now. She was laying up in a cave over the other side of the hill. And I had this premonition that we've been watching her for three hours and I frankly was bored. I thought, you know what, if she does move, she'll come over here, come up over that hill and come down. I thought, well, whatever. So I walked over there and in, in 15 minutes she did. And she came over the hill and then she looked off looking for guanacos and posed. And it was just, I mean, the rock formation and, and the, the puma, it was just like, ho oh. ho. Yeah, fantastic, beautiful. And you're gonna ask how close, <laughs> how close did I get? Well, okay, here's the answer that you have. Maybe. Oh, there we go. That is Blinka. She's probably the most famous uh, puma in that region. She had two cubs, which I never saw. She was, she hunted, she went 15 kilometers in one day. And uh, I, I followed her for 10 and I was exhausted beyond belief. Like, I don't, like she moves so effortlessly through the, that, that region. It's just ridiculous, but you get a sense of the expansiveness. This is one ranch. It's 20,000 acres of the two ranches that butt up against the park. It's, it's crazy. And we'll see that already. There's Blinka. The reason she's named Blinka is because her one eye, you can see it is, is actually damaged. I don't know if it was uh, when she was taking down a guanaco or what, but she has one, one eye that's probably not functional. And now this is not me after I got done hiking because I'm so tired. This is me looking for puma fur in a cave where they typically uh, have their young. I couldn't find a single hair. It was so windy that it just pushed everything out of the cave. Um, but I did find some later, which is pretty sweet. So I, cause I want to shoot them, uh, with the electron microscope eventually. That's the plan. And here is actually the fur of the side of a Puma up close. And with my camera, I shoot at like 61 megapixels. So I can actually get in pretty deep on this and, and not lose a lot of uh, detail, which is pretty sweet. 
So here's the poem. Let me uh, slide this down a little bit if I can without muting it. Okay. Torpidity. Benumbed by 10,000 calories and curled in a cave comatose, he undulated up under thunder snow. Warm bodies dispersed best dose. Yes, warm bodies dispersed best dose. Their throated purrs drowned sound silencers. His atoms vibrated, thrilled children. He slept, swaddled in a sea of fur. Now, that poem is, this guy basically is rescued um, by the pumas, which is, of course, a myth, and that would never happen. He ends up sleeping with them in this cave. So it was fun to actually, have, I'd already written that, so then to kind of have that experience of being in the cave was pretty sweet. And then this is the first day and the first puma as we're following her. You can get a sense of the landscape. And there she is. That's Hermanita. And she's very low, uh, low to the ground and she has a very big head. So she looks like a male, but she is actually a female and she's raised a number of, she's now she's 10 years old, uh, which is for a puma pretty old. I mean, to live to be 12 is pretty remarkable. And I'll jump past that. Here she is. And, and, and the reason why we know it's her is you can actually look at her face and identify her by the, mark, the marks that are on her face because she looks like she had a puncture wound below her eye. And you can tell by the size of her head too, and kind of some other scratch marks that, and even the color of her nose in some ways uh, is helpful to identifying her, but she's just beautiful. And this is another, uh, this is another puma that is, um, that is hunting. Uh, the one day we actually saw five on a kill and um, they were mostly sisters, which was pretty sweet. So this is called Chatter Marks. Shivering, he sought divine flashpoint. Obscured by snow, he decays, inconsolable, resigned to die. Then a puma charged its prey. Yes, then a puma charged its prey, wrestling a guanaco down boulders, nearly colliding with the shocked man. His wick, once primed and inert, smoldered. And then the last day, we... I, oh gosh, I, I spent five hours waiting for this shot. Five, well, no, that's not true. That was early in the morning. So we got one shot of him covering the kill. And then I waited five more hours for him to actually go to the kill and eat some. He slept the entire day. I just kept waiting. And so a lot of nature photography for me is being super, super patient, probably beyond most people's capacity. But it was just to be there and just to sit on the ground and wait was, was still very awesome. And so here I am, maybe. Let's see if it plays. There we go, oh, we'll go back. Let me go back. Well, anyway, there's a shot and I'll go back in a second. But you can see like, this is, this is him like consuming meat. Now I'm guessing he ate five to six pounds of guanaco flesh. Uh, let me see if it, let's see if we can get it to go here. It may not. Well, anyway, you get you get a sense of the shot. Whoa, hello. No, nope, we don't want that. Um, and just how how close I am, and just also like just you can see how the kill was covered over. Those are Mata Barbarossa uh, plants that he covers it over with. But you can, I, I did eat some guanaco just to try it, not from that kill, that's gross, but um, it was very stringy and kind of deer-like, uh, not something I'll ever have again, but just wanted to get a sense of it just so I could, you know, write the, write the book. So here's, here's the poem that goes with it. And then that's, that's, that's another, that's Sol, S-O-L, and she's like ripping the flesh off of the, another kill that we were at. Guanaco kill. Jolted, he wanted to live again. Puma pulled and peeled the hide and ate her fill of the deep red meat. New suffering and stepped aside. Yes, new suffering and stepped aside. Kneeling at the carcass, bowing down, he ate to satiate while she stood sentient. Her cubs bounded around. And this is Sol, and, and I'm sorry, this is kind of horrifying, but this is the head of a guanaco and she's tearing the flesh from the underneath of it. You can see the ribs on the bottom. And you also see how big her paw is. Like, 
I mean, I don't know. She's probably like 170, 165. She looks a lot bigger than that. She's a decent size, though, for a female uh, in this region. And then, of course, you've got the cubs. And oh my gosh, I only saw one. Um, there were five mothers with sets of cubs, and I saw one cub the entire time. Um, but they were just darling. He'd been eating on the carcass. You see, it's a very, very full tummy. And um, but in that light, it's just ridiculous. And he's already got giant paws. You know, he's going to he's going to be a, a big fella one day. And here he is again, playing um, uh, on his own, just messing around. And his mom had brought him a piece of liver and he kept he played with it. Then he ran away and then she got mad at him and shook it. And then she just ate the whole thing. It was really cute. So this is kind of the end, one of the end pieces, this is the second to last poem in the collection. And um, he's, this guy is finally coming out of his funk, right? So I've been talking a lot about the pandemic and kind of like how we felt isolated and kind of challenged. And I think this guy just really felt the same thing. Of course, it's not me. I, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't feel isolated. I felt, in a lot of ways, the pandemic was wonderful because I had a lot of time to write. Uh, and I know for a lot of people, it was very lonely. Um, but here, it's like he's reborn because these animals take care of him. And in a way, it could be a kind of metaphor for taking care of self, right? And you can see also here is Blinka licking her giant paw. But here is, they're called the ghost of the Andes because you ra rarely see them. But now you see them a lot, which is pretty sweet. So here is the poem. Her tongue combed his hair and cleaned the blood. It raked away his despair. She tended to him, mother to cub. White whiskers tickled his ear. Yes, white whiskers tickled his ear. Her claws napped contently, tucked in paws. Her long tail curled like a treble clef. Her fur velour, her eyes nebulas. And then the last poem in the whole collection, this is actually the whole collection, uh, I do this thing based on physics about uh, quarks. So if you, you'll maybe see the references and figure it out, but there's all, there's, I think seven different kinds. And um, yeah, so this is, this is a, this is a embodiment of the person kind of changing. And this is called Pantagruelian, which means gigantic, right? So you're this tiny little thing on this humongous landscape, but then there's this transformation that occurs and here it is. The recharged man was a neutrino, weight once zero, trail prolonged in this universe, pulled from black hole, his darkest matter restored, yes, his darkest matter restored. Sunlight traveled straight through his body, his gray shadow flipped from strange to charmed, his dead forest turned to luscious trees. And that is the end. Thank you, Paul. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, well, we'll take a minute now for those of uh, you who are on the webinar today, if you've got any questions for Paul, we encourage you to formulate those and drop them in the chat and we'll take um, some time to address them. Um, while you're getting your thoughts together, I do have a couple of questions to start with, Paul. Okay. Um, You've traveled all over the world. So I'm interested in knowing how you prioritize locations or a particular species that you focus on. I know you mentioned um, apex predators. Is that, mm -hmm. is that kind of a theme throughout the locations that you go to or the, the individuals that you focus on? Well, I see, I was trained as an ornithologist so I was mostly driven by birds. So I, so I, of course, Alaska and, and certainly Brazil and places like that certainly are more bird centric. But um, I think when I was in Brazil in 2011, it was like seeing my first Jaguar, it was kind of like a light bulb went off for me. And I, I think after that, I was sort of driven. I mean, I've been to lots of countries, but um, there's just something magical about being in a place with a predator who is so magnificent and also like somewhat dangerous that to spend time in that region is quite interesting. And it's different, like United States generally, I mean, I, you know, I've been, I've had my moments with grizzly bears, but um, generally, I'm walking around Iowa. I'm not too scared. You know, I'm not worried about I'm not worried about a mountain lion. 
I've tracked them and, and I won't say where, but I've tracked them and, you know, I just, you just never see them. Uh, they're, they are really ghosts in Iowa. Sometimes people will catch them on their doorbell cam or something, but it's a rarity. So I think it's really for me now, um, thinking about apex predators and kind of their role. And so, yeah, I want to, I'd really like to go to Antarctica soon. I think that's the next play and, and really look at so leopard seals and, you know, killer whales and whatnot. So that would be interesting to me, but yeah. All right, and then we've got some coming in. Emma asks a uh, meta question here. As a photographer, what was it like choosing or finding a photographer you could trust to document your trips? <laughs> well, it was just happenstance. Javier, I told her what I was doing for this project and she said, well, I'm not very good, but I'll be happy to do it for you. And I was like, oh, you're very kind. And so she was just really learning. So what I think it was good because, uh, I mean, I think Bruce said that too, it was like more raw. So it was like, I was really in the field and it's kind of like we're moving around and it's like, you're, you're there with us. And so I think it, it was a good, it, the technique, which she didn't even understand worked out really well. Um, but typically I don't have anyone taking pictures of me cause I'm too busy taking pictures. No one, no one's really photographing me cause who cares, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's important to show that I think for especially for this project I was working on to show how that play how it works right yeah I think a lot of people think oh you just go take you take some photos somewhere and it's this easy thing well it's oh my gosh I, I the last day I traveled 28 hours to get home uh, and it was brutal and I and I I will tell you like I didn't think I was going to make it into Chile so I really was going to come home uh, the COVID thing has been really a challenge. And so, um, and I've got photographer friends who are there right now. And I said, here's everything you don't want to do. Cause I made every mistake you could make. And then we fixed it. It was, or I fixed it. And then it was fine, but I was calling the consulate. I'm calling the health ministry. I'm doing all this stuff. And eventually I was able to get through, but you just have to be persistent. And it's not, sometimes it's not fun, but that's also part of the journey. Part of traveling is discomfort. And part of being a nature photographer is discomfort. And if you don't want to suffer, you're not going to get the shots. <laughs> so on these expeditions that you go on, is it, what is the group size like? Is it you and a guide? Or it was you me. Get... It was, well, yeah, I was the only one. It was, there were, there were two guides. Uh, they were married couples. So that's, okay. they, that's why they were together. But he didn't speak, he speaks Portuguese, which I speak some Portuguese. And then uh, she speak, and he speaks a little Spanish. And then she speaks Spanish, Portuguese, and English. So it was like this fascinating he's an amazing tracker and uh and she's really good at kind of documenting everything and 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 you know talking talking to people and figuring it out so it's pretty that's a good combination i don't like to go with a big group because they're taking the same shots i'm taking right so i don't uh, you know i've and i've and i've done that so when i go to when i when i go to brazil i go by myself i have a boat person and then we're both looking for them we both will find them which is fine so I typically do it on my own because I, I just don't want any replication. Uh, it's tricky that way, but yeah. Great. Um, question from Louise. Uh, so are the Pumas not interested in human flesh? It's incredible and marvelous how close you are to them. <laughs> I, the, I had the funniest interaction with the big male Pajaro, which I will not translate for you because we're, we're, we're in gentle company with each other. Terrible <laughs> name, by the way, terrible name. But anyway, look it up on your own, whatever. Um, the, he looked at me and he's like, the look was, I could kill you. I'm not interested. Just stay away from my food. I'm like, okay. I mean, I literally said out loud, okay. I could just see the look like, he's like, just stay away from that. Two guys who were there went, walked up to it and were poking it. And I was like, and I'm saying to them, get away from that. Are you out of your mind? Cause you, one, if you're okay. So here's the kill and here, here's the animal, right? And they're walking between, that's of no-no, one. Mm -hmm. The other is you're touching that. I'm just like, please stop. And, and, and the one guy I really respect, I was like, seriously, stop doing that. And they got a little mad, then they stopped. But um, no, you, 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 you wanna, you have to give them space, right? It's the same when we're, pho when we're photographing jaguars, you're giving them a hundred feet, but you're in a boat. It's a different situation. Here, you're on the ground. So you're a little bit more in the way, right? especially when they're hunting, you don't want to, you don't want to impede them or, or, or set off the alarm that, you know, here, here, here I come making lots of noise and being talking loud because then the guanacos are watching you too. 
Right. So, well, along those same lines, I'm interested, are there, and especially for folks who aren't all that familiar with nature photography, are there certain ethical considerations you have to yeah. keep in mind when you're out in the field? And if so, what, what are some of those? Well, there's, there are so many people who are unethical. I can't even tell you like there's a, there's, well, I have an Instagram account with a, with a friend of mine and we do, it's all ethical photography. We talk, try to talk about that, but essentially there are people who will cut branches there are people who will call in animals. They will do anything they can to get the shot. And so I will always sacrifice the shot if I feel like I'm messing up the, the behavior, right? I'll walk away. And, and honestly, sometimes I get pretty excited, like, oh gosh, here's the kill. And I found myself getting closer than I should have. And then she's like, hey, now wait. I'm like, oh, you're right. All right. Okay. So, so you have to be careful of being too excited and, and, and check yourself, right? So what's the distance? How far am I gonna go? Um, the time, the one that went by us, she said, don't show that to anybody, we're too close. But I was sitting, it went by me. So I feel like I didn't, I was way, well, I was hundred feet away and then it came through, this came passing by me. So I'm like, it's, it's okay. But if I approached it, that's wrong. So I gotta be careful. So my exuberance can get in the way of good ethics but I think I do a pretty good job overall, so. Um, what is one of the greatest lessons you have learned while observing wildlife? Is there, have, have any species or individuals been great teachers to you? And, and if so, is there anything? I will tell you the, the, I mean, seriously, this is always my A number one thing. So I, I had, this is funny because um, my, one of my guides, Junior, he was in Brazil and I didn't, I, I didn't know him until I went to Chile, but I'd seen him in Brazil and they had had a jaguar on a tree. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to use him as a guide one day. <laughs> and then later on, I, that's how it works, by the way. And so then I saw he was guiding in Chile. I was like, that guy, that's the guy for me. I trust that guy. So I said to myself, I want a jaguar in a tree. And then my guide is like, you'll never see one. You're never going to get one. And I said, yes, I will. So then when I went back in 2018, uh, we turned the corner and there was a mom and a cub going into a tree that would fall over the river. And I watched them for an hour and a half and she was cleaning the cub and they were, you know, huddling together and uh, just, he was loving on her. And I was just like, holy smokes. And then what was, what was amazing was once I had that image and I took, I don't even remember, I took... 3,000 photographs or some stupid amount of photographs. It was awesome. And then a friend of mine, now a friend, Arjan Janganil, actually had a picture of her killing a 15-foot-long anaconda, and then they were wrestling with it together, and then she let him take it off and eat it. And it, it's in our book that we have. And it was like, it was also like another part of all this, this equation of really good motherhood and just the kind of bond that they share. And then at two years, well, a year and a half, usually two years, she just gets mad at him and tells him, go away. And then this kicks him out and then they have to go fend for themselves. And it's like, ew. but it's a, it's a really good lesson in like the best kind of parenting, but also like the hardest thing to say, you have to say no eventually. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I just felt like I was learning so much as watching that. So it was amazing. Excellent. Great. Yeah. Um, in terms of that, you you were just mentioning how how many photographs you take. What is that editing process like for you? A lot of your work pairs images with your poetry, and yeah. are you often in this past project? You said that um, you had written a lot of the poems first, and then you know had an experience and were able to take images that sort of reflected what was in those poems. Is that typically how the way you the way you work, or do you take photographs and then write poetry afterwards? It depends on the project. I've, I've done it both ways. So I've, I did, I did write a lot of these before I went, which is funny because it, like I said, it all played out that way, but then I've done it before where I've take all the photographs and then come back and, and then write the poems. Um, I basically did that for my Florida book. Um, cause I had, I'd had all the photographs already. I'd taken, oh, I don't even know. I mean, hundred thousand photographs, I guess of that region. So I could just go through and call them out and pick the ones I wanted. And then I was like, okay, so now I know what I want the book to look like. So then I have to write stuff to it. So it just depends on the project. And um, I feel like this one was, I had time to write on my own. So then that led to writing the poems first. But I think a lot of times you get really inspired by taking the photos. And it's also kind of a journal, 
or a photographic essay reminder of all that you did, and that helps you then write. So it works both ways, but yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about too, I'm fascinated by the way you incorporate local forms mm -hmm. into your work. Um, thinking about language as the keeper of culture and the culture yeah. as a keeper of place. Can you talk about your process for selecting certain forms? Um, and then also whether whether there's any particular form that has given you a significant revelation about a new way to see the world? That's a loaded yeah. one. I mean, no, it's, no, it's, a great, it's a great set of questions there. I mean, it's uh, it, to, to think about some some forms are so tricky that uh, uh, like I did the, the Iceland book is there's 121 different how to tell. So those are Norse forms. And so over time, those were told to orally to tell tell these stories and for remembering. Right. So one, it's in Icelandic. So and then so you've got to first of all figure out how that translates into English, which is tricky, and then you've got to make sense of those. And so I really I took about I did about 44 of them, but I tried to take the hardest ones. And but what I was learning was first Icelandic language, secondly, sort of terminology of the region. So I could talk about and my, you just you're not going to just say like, oh, it's a blueberry. It's got to be like a crowberry or what, you know, for the region. You've got to figure out what those things are. And so you're learning kind of like the natural history of the region. You're also learning the cultural kind of uh, ways that things, how things are spoken and how things are said. And then also the sound relationships that you can hear. So yeah, it's a lot to decode, but it's fun to do that. And it teaches you a lot about the, the environment and it really is instructive then. So I, I, try, to t I try to pick something that really challenges me so those would, those would be good examples of that kind of in action, but you're right. It's, it's exhausting, but it's, it's, but it's, but it's like research, right? You're researching this thing and then all the, and I keep, I keep all these journals, right? And then I go back and I'm using that as kind of fodder for creating the poem uh, later on. And, and it's, it's like a repository of information that really will be helpful. So I've got, to, I've really got, I really need to write like two more uh, Australian if I, to, I have the collection done, but I feel like I need to add two more and take some other stuff out. Going back to that's going to be tricky because I was in that space and now I'm out of it. I'm scared. I'm a scared. I'm scared to go back to it, honestly. Well, it's, it's, a new a new way of looking at the world, right? It's a whole different way of sort of speaking and seeing when you're yeah. working in another language. Yeah. Um, I'm curious along those lines too, just to bring it back to Iowa. Um, one of your earlier works used was it I Irish forms Irish to describe forms, yeah. the Irish or the Iowa landscape. Can mm -hmm, you talk yeah. a little bit about why you selected those forms to talk about Iowa? Well, I mean, obviously, like they're an agrarian society, so their forms are basically, and no pun intended, grounded in the earth. So, yeah. like when you read them, you get this sense of that farming and and being connected to the land is and the soil is like intrinsically important to them. And so that translates perfectly to Iowa. Like it's the same kind of feeling for sure. I feel like the Welsh, like some of the Welsh forms are that way too, although they lend themselves more to being political, right? So I've got some, some new poems in this collection that are Welsh forms, which are somewhat tricky, but they, they, are, they lend themselves to the kind of political aspect. So the poems, just because you're picking them doesn't mean it may be the subject matter may be connected to that you have to be very careful what to what to what to write about right i don't think i'd do a welsh poem and write about um what uh, pumas i wouldn't do it it wouldn't, it wouldn't work but a quaker chilena does because you feel the rhythms of the earth and that repetition which is, which is what you're feeling when you're in places in chile like that same kind of feeling so it makes sense wonderful cool um Okay, it looks like we've got one final one in um, from Louise. Oh, Louise. Uh, Paul, do you teach full time? Your creative work is incredible. How do you oh. balance teaching with creative work? I am just I do it very poorly, Louise. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I do it like you do it. I mean, I just I I try to prioritize, but teaching to me honestly is so important. And so I find myself during the school year really focusing on that. And then in the summer, like starting, like I'm kind of excited because we are into finals next week. And then I'm released to the world. So I'm excited to, to work on that part of it. I do a lot of publication stuff during the year. 
a lot of revising, a lot of sending out, uh, some travel, not always, just depends. But yeah, so I'm trying to balance that. Um, but I'm telling you right now, what's been really great for my students is I've been doing a lot of book publication and we just had our, our we just had our alumni prize, hold on. And our students des designed and they did the whole book, like the whole thing. They designed and edited the whole, it's beautiful. I mean, I'm, you know, so you're, you've, you're trying to equate like, you're, you're doing these things, but then they kind of move themselves into the classroom and then you're teaching your students the things that you want them to know that, that are important to you as well, but then you have the best of both worlds. So I think that's it. And to be a practicing artist, like you are, Louise, to be a practicing writer, is important to showing students like, yeah, you can do this. Um, yeah, you can teach too, but yeah. So <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta find the balance, right? Great. Good. Well, um, with that, Paul, I know you've got to get to class here in yep. a few minutes. So I just wanna take a moment to thank you again for sharing your work with us today. Um, and thanks to those of you on the webinar for joining us. We will be sending a recording of this presentation out to everyone who registered shortly. And we do encourage you to reg register for our upcoming Meet the Artist events um, here in April and May at our website at iowaculture.gov. They will include Brittany Brooke Crow's representation in self-portraiture on April 28th, Emma Murray's Dear Casey project on May 5th, and Francesca Sohn's Filming Memory, Memory as Film on May 12th. So thanks again, Paul, for sharing your work with us today. And thanks again to our audience for joining us. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye, everybody.